Welcome to another edition of Spotlight. Now today we are very privileged to have a freelance producer director in the form of the amazing Gareth Fitzsimons. Hello Gareth. Hello Brendan, good to see you and uh, glad to be a guest on this uh, now infamous or should I say famous Spotlight. <laughs> and uh, hopefully I'll, I can pass off some decent information when I'm here. Oh, well, it's, it's amazing. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about your route into television. How did you get from being a student to where you are today? I always knew that I would like to get into media someday. I was always interested in the art of writing and English at school. And I um, always thought I would uh, like to be a journalist because I was told my writing skills were quite good. Um, I left school after GCSEs and after a little bit of A-levels, I decided that wasn't the route for me and to become more practical. So I did the, what was called a BTEC back in the day, I think it's called the GNTQ nowadays, um, in media, journalism and photography for two years. And then I started a course in Belfast, which was called eForce Media, which was a year uh, course, 12 months, and you get paid to do it. So I thought that around 18, 19, happy days, this will do me. And the biggest pull about it was that you did four months in-house learning journalism, uh, radio, and also television. And for the other eight months, you were given a placement in somewhere like the BBC or UTV, also television, which it was over here, the subsidiary of ITV. And I thought, fantastic way to get in then, and because I'd heard great reports about it. Now, the timing, I believe that everything in life is about timing. And the ceasefire in Belfast in Ireland, and Northern Ireland, I should say, kicked in in 1994. And there was an initiative called Border Vision that came about, and six students from Derry, six students from Belfast, and six students, 18 in total, um, one for us, sorry, the others from Dublin, were picked to learn the art of filmmaking. So I got to go off for a year and got taught by Roddy Dog how to write scripts and things like that and get tips off famous producers. So I went down the line of filmmaking in 16 mil for a year and a half, two years, producing short films and learning how to edit. Um, I then was about to move to LA to try and break into the filmmaking world. And I was living in Belfast for a year, getting the money together to go and do that on a one-way ticket. Um, when I saw an advert for BBC Northern Ireland, and it was um, two disability placements, funny enough, for 12 weeks. And um, so three months, and I thought I could do this because I'm deaf in one ear, fully deaf in my right ear from meningitis as a child. So that's seen as a disability. So I went for the interview and I got accepted for the 12 week placement. And one was for news and one was for sport. And I had been lucky enough to use the first Avid editing machine that came into Ireland. Um, on another course I was doing and uh, a little company had been given a, a bit of money and they bought invested in Avid so I taught myself how to use Avid when it was in there and I mentioned this during the interview with the BBC and they said oh Avid because the forerunner of BBC3 and um, at that time was called BBC Choice I think it was and they had to produce a show for this and had to do it on the new Avid they had bought so uh, the boss of BBC Sport at the time Terry Smith brought me in and straight away in those 12 weeks and during a placement window i was then editing programs for broadcast already and i was like okay then uh he can do this so that 12 week placement turned into a 20 year career in the bbc <laughs> <laughs> did you have a particular when you were in the bbc did you have a particular job i.e either producing or either directing or either editing that you really liked and really excelled at well, editing came naturally to me, and I think my whole family are musical. Um, and I wasn't, I never picked up an instrument, but I believe that um, they have a sense of timing but to play music, um, and that sense of timing was lent to me in editing. Um, so I knew that when, when to cut shots, etc. I was allowed because I was a broadcast assistant to work on a range of programming, and I did a bit of radio presenting. And features, and then I made a few features for a, uh, a couple of big programs and edited them, and they really enjoyed those. And from there, I worked on the Saturday show called Final Score, which you'll see on BBC Network every um, Saturday afternoon. And there was always one feature football match, and they would send me out to direct two cameras 
through a satellite news relevant vehicle and brought me back into the building. So it was two cameras and they threw me at it and I enjoyed it. And the boss said, look, you make uh, two cameras look like four, which is a great thing to be able to do. And one day I was up working at a OB um, with five or six cameras and a, a sporting event um, during the summer. And the person, the director felt sick and they were in a panic. And the boss went, you jump in there, <laughs> this sort of thing. And the way I saw it was, I played a lot of computer games and surely it's just pressing the right buttons in the right order. And I stepped into this massive outside broadcast truck and it was like the control deck of the Starship Enterprise. <laughs> it was like, oh my God, right, sit in this chair. And I just fitted. I just knew it was for me, um, I had no fear. I am. Um, uh, I had respect for it, but I was uh, give me it, you know, and I rocked it. Basically, I nailed it, and then um, it went from there. And they threw me at bigger and bigger things, and then I knew that directing, really, and multi-camera directing was was the biggest buzz for me and what I wanted to do. So we spoke to Michael Bryant, who's obviously a multi-camera TV director, but he is um, in drama. So everything is scripted and everything, and he can, he's got time to form pictures in his head and all that. But from your, yours is slightly different because yours is completely doing it by what my mentors used to call doing it by the seat of your pants. Um, so what, yes. so tell us about that experience, actually. How do you prep for a big sporting event knowing that there's no script uh how do you do that because it was the bbc and they do things differently from commercial i've done sky uh sports i've done channel 4 itv there last year did world cup rugby for itv uh women's world cup rugby and they're all work different but with the bbc if you're a director you have to vision mix your own stuff i was never taught how to vision mix i taught myself but also, if you're doing an outside broadcast, you're also the studio director as well as the match or event director. So the, you will know what a running order is. And so if we had a three-hour show, I would be on air for half an hour with studio output first, then the match, say, and then the halftime studio analysis and debate, and then the second half of the match, and then studio debate. So some bits are scripted and you'll have cut features, et cetera, um, that you would drop in. So, and then I always enjoy getting to the match because you can make it up as you go along then and doing it on the fly. So to prepare as such, you obviously would know your script and you go through rehearsals, et cetera, beforehand and work with the presenter and with bits of script to say what the shot would work coming in and out of this piece of uh, uh, footage or program slug as we call them. But with the game itself, if say I was working on a sport, it might be international rugby. I directed international rugby and it was Ireland versus Italy and I knew none of the Italian players, but I knew the commentators would be called in their names, etc. And I would have to call the shot and know who he's talking about. So you familiarize yourself, so you print out um, little head pictures of each player so you knew what they looked like. Etc. Etc. Or who the uh, opposing manager and their team, etc. Would be so we had a visual reference to them, and also I suppose if you're with, with sport without a script, you've got total freedom, and that that's the most beautiful thing about it. That was the thing that excited me about it. So in in a way, you don't prepare, if that makes sense. Um, what you can do is talk to your commentators, etc., beforehand on site and what who they'd like to focus on during the game, during a dull part of the game, or leading into the game before kickoff, if they'd like to focus on the referee or a certain player, or somebody making their 300th appearance, say, for a certain team. I've directed a lot of Ulster rugby, and that was always quite heavily featured in the ground. But you can only prepare so much. And that's the beauty of it. And the scripted stuff just comes naturally to you because if you're studio directed inside a studio, it's just the exact same as that. And then you switch into match director mode. And um, sometimes you would have, if you're a studio director, you would sit to the side with the vision mixer, a vision mixer, and they would cut the studio for you. And then you'd swap roles and jump into his position for the match and cut it and jump back. But mostly I would cut the whole thing, which is up to four, four and a half hours I did one night of live broadcast without a break, one comfort break for the toilet, 
Um, so it's a lot of concentration. So uh, when you do get tired, you tend to sit in camera one a lot <laughs> and give yourself a breather because the human mind can only really focus for 10 minutes at a time. You've got to realize that. So you've got to build in time as well. But to answer your question, you prepare by knowing your subject material and who's going to be featured in it. Do your homework. And from start, you would uh, work on a run-in order with the presenter. And then a production meeting would be held usually the day of or the day before or on site, running through each page of the run-in order and how that material is gathered. It's, uh, the director's sitting there and that's sure you're the conductor of an orchestra. Really, that's what I would like in the two. Um, your, say your sound could be compared to percussion and your brass is your graphics department and your slow moves. So you've got all these different elements that you need to bring together as one and put it out through the master channel as seamless. And uh, that's not as easy as it sounds. So to make that job easier, especially if you're a camera director, um, we used to have a meal and sit down and eat before you did the job. And I would always sit with the camera crew and go and, especially if there was a new camera crew sitting there or being uh, brought in and decide what they want out of it, what we're going to aim for tonight. Say, I always used to have a little bit of fun with them, you know, and say it was Valentine's, whoever gets the best couple of kissing shot, that type of thing, gives them something to aim for, you know. <laughs> but generally, everybody that's in their positions are there for a reason, and they're there on merit, and they're good enough at their jobs. So you trust in that. But as I say, bring it all together is... is there is a certain mind for the production. It'll have a certain style, and it's up to you to deliver that, but also to put your own style on it. I was quite, um, I've always been a quite artistic director and do things in a different style, and then um, people have got to be in tune then with what you want to deliver that. Um, obviously, the production side of it, if you're there on the day and building up to a big event, um, what you will have is a lot of nerves and sometimes fear because it's a massive uh, commitment. It's a massive responsibility. You know, uh, if you're dealing with sports rights, especially, you know, somebody has paid, you know, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of pounds to, earn, to get the rights to show this. So they want the perfect product. <laughs> it's up to you to deliver it. What you take, do with that energy of fear is use it as, uh, realize it's an energy, the fear is an emotion and it's an energy and flip it into positivity and use that energy to drive you forward. What you have to have is a, a, a certain level of assertiveness, of cockiness to a degree, and, um, and then people will follow you in what you say, and to um, bring that production from the producer's mind onto the screen. How many cameras would you have on a big sporting event? I have, if you talk to a proper director, um, especially rugby purists will say you only need three cameras, maximum five. Um, a lot of extra cameras will be for slow moves or for technicals or, you know, for different calls to do with the game and the umpires and sit inside your truck, etc. as well. Um, but generally on a sporting event, I would have maybe 12, maybe 15, and two or three of those will be dedicated to a studio as well, and then break and add, become extra cameras on your OB. The most I directed was for old time Grandstand, if you remember Grandstand as a show. And it was ice hockey because the Belfast Giants had got to their first final in Belfast. Um, so they decided, oh, well, you'll direct that for us. I'd never seen ice hockey in my life, but I, I knew I was going to have 22 cameras. So I sat up, Channel 4 used to show it on uh, about one o'clock in the morning uh, during the week. So I sat up and watched it and got my head around it. So 22 live cameras, so you're sitting in front of your, and you see a bank of screens and there's 22 live inputs. And that's not to mention your five slow-mo inputs, your three graphics inputs, and your world feed that you might be looking after as well. It's another conversation. But, um, so you might be looking at, and to, uh, that day I was looking at maybe 40 screens that were relevant to me. Wow. So uh, what you do then is prioritize and think, these are the main cameras I need here. And these are the superfluous ones. And here's where I use the beauty cameras. Some are locked off as safeties, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so you can have, it can be quite daunting. So if you imagine, I'm sure your students can imagine um, a production deck. So you've got your main output, which is PP, and then your preview buttons. And you have two main screens in the middle. 
and that's all you're worried about. One is what's coming up next, and one is what's going out live. And don't mix the two up. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> that's easy done. Um, but it's just whatever preference is your style. But people usually work left to right. But um, so you, that's your main focus. Cover the action. Don't miss anything. And remember, your first, your main cameras are one, two, and three. So your first one will be your stops and wide shot. Your safety net, basically. Your second camera will be for personalities, and your third one's for art and close-ups, etc. And the other ones, then you work in around that. And once you're comfortable within the OB, you start to use the extra cameras. Or the, um, if you have that many cameras, don't be afraid to use your uh, production assistant or your producer, who's might be beside you, and say, "Camera A, it's got a great shot," because it might be out of your eye line and use it. Or if they're talking about somebody, the commentators, and you don't have them in the shot but it's in camera 15, <laughs> you know, somebody else might spot that, so they'll give you notes, 15, 15. So, you know, that's it. Um, so the way to handle that and not be overwhelmed by it is remember if you might have 20 cameras, but you don't have to use them all, mm. you know, you, you, that's it. Every, every cut you make should have a reason. You, you talked about art and, you know, you say um, that you have an artistic style. Uh, that that's interesting. That's interesting coming from a sports sort of director. I've never heard that before. What how, what form does your art, art take on screen? I would have a whole feel for the program. As I say, I used to have the input of all the BTS, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, into it. But with sport, there is something called you know a pace and a flow. And if you have a fast bit of action going on in front of you, a very high pitch, fast, frenetic game, your cutting will reflect that. So you will cut quickly and that injects energy and covers that. It's also reflects the pace of the action that you're seeing. If you've got a slow game, you can try and speed it up and add a bit of life to it by cutting quicker, etc. But say you're at a sporting event and it's often, say, a one minute silence for some person that has died or passed away. That's a totally different style of cutting. So you're doing slow dissolves, then hands joined together, faces and crowds, nice close ups. My trick that I used, um, I do slow dissolves. I would get camera three to pick up a nice, um, say, big, big close up. Say somebody's been through a lot of pressure. Well, then you want to see their eyes. If they're under pressure, zoom right into their face, get their eyes. When I'm at Wimbledon doing a high uh, pressure tennis match and it's a person serving to stay in the semi final, say, really and truly. Yeah. Um, so you, you want to see that. And the way to do that is get into the eyes and see what's going on between them and the grey matter. But slow dissolves, or if, um, say, a bit of art would be, well, the parents of that person is in the crowd and I would have found that out before and picked them out. So I'll cram myself and get to that. So, you know, you go to their mum in the crowd, something like this, yeah. you know, commentator can work off that or a slow dissolve. Uh, you take a, a close up of that. With some of these rugby players but take a kick and on a profile. And I would say the camera three drifts off to the right. And as the camera moved in the empty space, I would do a mix to a nice low angle of say the post he's kicking at. And you know it should flow, and that that's adding art. Your your eyes should never judder at it, but also it should be. Whoa, what's that? Oh, that's nice. I don't. I never see that before in the production. You know, uh, well, I bet you Fitzy's directing that. I'll say. You. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you said you mentioned one thing which I thought was quite interesting, which is that one of the one of the BBC boffins had said you make two cameras look like four. Um, I thought that was that, I thought that was quite an interesting comment. Um, if you're working in an environment where you've got only three cameras and you want to make it look like more cameras, what? How would you do that? I would say you're sitting wide on camera one, and then you take a quick shot of camera two of a certain bit, quickly back to one, and then you've already set camera two to go and a different shot size to another feature that you want to feature and put them cut that in quickly and it's like how many cameras has he got you know that sort of a way it's just the speed your cameras get there and it's like you're cutting three or four cameras with different size shots but really it's just two and as i say it's up it's very much uh, reliant on the 
I suppose, skill of your camera people at the time. The trick of directing is, is always to be assertive, assertive, confident, and um, people will follow you and cameras will respect you and, and work harder for you. Mm-hmm. So, so that's what you'd say are the key skills of a multi-camera TV director? Oh, there's a plethora of skills that you need that you don't even know. Um, it all sounds very daunting. Don't forget, you know, it, it is completely doable. Um, it's the, I am completely deaf in my right ears, I say. And I would say the number one uh, key skill to have would be communication. So obviously I'm at, um, I have a headphone in one ear. I can't hear anything else. So I have it half on, half off, but still manage to communicate, but ask for a bit more quiet when I get it. And you have to be able to prioritize. A lot of different uh, people will be talking to you at once. Floor managers wanting to talk to you. Now you can palm a lot of this off to your producer perhaps to deal with, but you'll have floor managers, commentators, presenters, uh, contributors, uh, graphics, sound, all types of different people talking to you at once. You've got to prioritize very quickly who's number one to deal with her and deal with that problem and then move on to the elements of the relevant or let, let themselves sort it out. Um, you've got to be able to think quickly on your, your feet, basically, and adapt very quickly to scenarios. It's very easy to direct when it's all going well, but when things really go belly up, you have got to be that one person when uh, it's all falling around you and people are panicking that, boom, it's okay, we got this, do this, 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 and this, and everything will be fine. Okay, you do that, oh, and boom, and you do not see the panic going out on there that going on behind the camera and that's when the director really earns his crust so keeping your head um when all around you're losing theirs is a very very big one um you've got to be creative you've got to offer something different i, I believe to make yourself stand out above the crowd so don't be afraid to take risks and and offer shots that you've never seen before offered that do work and they are there in certain scenarios you've got to be able to hold your focus uh, and concentrate. If you lose your focus for 20 seconds at the wrong time, the whole thing would fall apart. Okay. Also, mistakes will happen um, during productions because it's live television. Mistakes happen, and they may may well be your fault, and especially at the top of a program, um, at the start of it. And if you don't control that, it will have a knock-on domino effect for the rest of the production, and you'll never catch up with it. People will respect you a lot more as a director. They'll expect you to make mistakes. But it's how you cope with that mistake. Don't let it bury you. Get it, get rid of it, and use it to spur you on not to make another mistake during that production. And remember, it's only television. It's um, people watching at home when they watch live TV. If they see a mistake, they're thinking, "Well, I'm definitely watching something live here because cargo happens, you know." So, um, um, assertiveness is a, is a great thing. Um, people will only follow you. Nobody will do anything um, on on the set or as part of the crew unless you say it. Um, if you start to not deliver the right lines, you know, or keep people in check, they they lose interest. So you've got to always hold people's, I suppose, concentration and um, awareness of what's coming up. The ability as well to be able to think five step, steps ahead. Um, you have to be a good people person also. Um, but you also have to be the one you also have to be a bit of a bully and also maybe not nasty at times, but um, you have to, when things are falling in around you, you might have to bully a few people into and, and doing what they, you know, they want them to do. And presenters can be very difficult to <laughs> you know, so um, realize that it's you in charge and everybody must do as you say. It's very interesting because I remember being, when I was a live television director, uh, one of the first things that I encountered was presenters and difficult presenters at that. Um, and it's interesting uh-huh. you mentioned there about presenters. Um, in Obviously in the lives of the students, when they start becoming directors, they're going to encounter talent very quickly. Um, what, yes. what would you say are your top tips with directing talent? And in particular, if you encounter sort of it's very easy when you get ta- a, a talent that, you know, is going to listen to you and going to give you yeah. their opinions. That's wonderful when that happens. But in my experience, there are a number of 
people who, you know, feel it's their show. Don't talk to me. You know, I don't, I'm not interested. So how do you deal with uh, talent? What would you say would be some of the things they need to watch out for? When I first encountered difficult presenters, um, I would say egos. <laughs> who, uh, presenters often think they're the producer and director as well. And um, they need to, to listen to you. But generally before the production, if you've never worked with this person before, a presenter or talent, it could be a commentator, it could be a, a you know, a guest, a studio guest, or it could be, you know, a contributor that's uh, working with you on the sideline. Um, uh, basically go and introduce yourself and say, I'm such and such, you know, I'm a great fan of your work, pick them up. Yeah, for certain, for certain, pick them up. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. Everyone loves being flattered. <laughs> and if you want to try something different with them or you have an idea, come to them with a good idea and say, what about, say, if we do the opening link, there's obviously a great, um, the opening link to your program is always a great area to show some creativity and to set up the top of your show and the feel of it and everything follows from there. So maybe offer a different slant than what they're thinking, but something that's really good that they might like, okay, we'll try that. We'll do two versions. We'll do your version. We'll do my version. And then a producer might say, oh, I like this version that you've sort of said. And, oh, the presenter will go grudgingly, be grudgingly. Oh, okay, we'll try that. And maybe the, the presenters always watch their out to back. A lot of directors do too. They might look at it and go, actually, that worked. He knows what he's talking. He or she knows what he's talking about, you know? Um, and that's, that's a good help. But... If you're struggling under the weight of it, and I've been there myself, and I've had slagging matches over talk back with presenters, you know, it does happen. Um, you know, but just sit there and do what they're told. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's um, positive to the producer. That's what they're there for. The producer can then speak, uh, you know, if, you, if you're having an issue. But generally, try and get along with them, but offer something to them, and they try and earn that, their respect. So what then is the best bit of the job. Um, the, the buzz of it really, um, you know, you're being at these amazing events and you're, you're the one deciding what goes out there. The last time I directed at Bumbledon, I was live on BBC One, it was the Serena and Venus Williams were playing um, uh, mixed up, or doubles, mixed doubles, so they're playing against each other in the show court and I, I, was, I was lucky enough to have it. And I had real cameras and tracking cameras and cameras 300 feet in the sky, all sorts there. And BBC One just come through. This is now we're taking you for the next half an hour to one o'clock news. I'm like, okay, everybody, don't say crap, crap, crap. <laughs> you know, it's uh, uh, okay. We're live on BBC One here, so watch your P's and Q's for commentators and cameras. Be on point, you know, and everyone on point, and you sharp. And again, then um, it was millions watching their live. And once I come off that, my friend was behind my back watching it because he knew I would have been nervous, maybe getting it. And uh, he just slapped me on the back at the end of it. I didn't even realise it was there. He went, great job, great job, great job. You know, all these type of things. And it's, um, you get a real buzz of adrenaline uh, off it. And it's, it's hard to describe. It's, it's unmatchable than doing any kind of scripted or pre-recorded output. Because you've, you've done it. You've put yourself a huge challenge. And it, let me tell you, it's, it's not an easy seat to be in. And... Um, You've pulled it off and you know, it's like, woof, it's a great boost of self-confidence. It's a great buzz. The adrenaline will leave you but two hours later and you'll cry out in your sofa. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, um, it's, 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 I suppose, um, the best thing about it is you're only as ever as good as your last gig and you, you can do a bad one and you know, you do two good ones the next time and everyone thinks you're great again, you know. So <laughs> it's very easy to uh, wipe, wipe out your, your past as well. <laughs> Gareth at Simons, thank you so much for being on Spotlight. Not a problem. It's been a pleasure, Brendan. It's great to see you again, as always. And uh, good luck to all your students. I hope uh, they go on to great careers and uh, this little bit of advice. I'm sure I haven't said half the stuff I could have said, but um, hopefully what I've said has been of some use to them. And remember, remain confident and be yourself and smile will go a long way. 